Okay, so polyphenols protect plants from damage. Now, years ago, we used to think that polyphenols were primarily antioxidants. And for years and years and years, we measured the polyphenol content by what was called an ORAC rating, O-R-A-C. That's the oxygen radical absorbing capacity. And it looked at whether these compounds could actually absorb free radicals. And for years and years and years, uh, this was the standard by which we judged polyphenol content. Unfortunately, it turns out that these compounds, when we swallow them, are not doing that at all. And so if you hear people say that the reason to get polyphenols into your diet is that they are antioxidants, uh, number one, don't believe them. And number two, that's not how they work. And I'm really excited when you see my new book you'll actually see exactly the power of polyphenols, and it has nothing to do with their ability to absorb free radicals or as antioxidants. But their power is actually far more important. And one of the most recent findings is that polyphenols are actually prebiotics. In other words, if you remember prebiotics, are what your friendly bacteria, the probiotics, like to eat. So first and foremost, whoever says that polyphenols are the plant defense system against being eaten, and that polyphenols, because of that, are extremely damaging to your health, uh, first of all, doesn't know what they're talking about. Number two, that's not how polyphenols work for the plant. And they're not a defense system of the plant. That's what lectins are for. That's what phytates are for, not polyphenols. The second thing is uh, people who say polyphenols are bad for you actually don't realize that polyphenols feed friendly bacteria. And there's a host of evidence that you'll see in my upcoming book about the incredible benefit of polyphenols in actually changing the gut microbiome for the better. Our listeners who don't know about vitamin D and the prostate, can you uh, tell us what you talk about in the book? Yeah, well, the interesting thing is they have identified vitamin D receptors on the prostate cells, which, you know, like most other cells in the body, Vitamin D has so far, you know, so many far-ranging uh, effects. So they have shown in studies that men are, that are vitamin D deficient are more likely to have BPH or prostate enlargement. Now, we've known for a long time, as with other cancers, men who are vitamin D deficient are more likely to get prostate cancer. And there's many reasons for this. Vitamin D helps to control inflammation. Vitamin D is directly involved in cell division, cell replication. Uh, vitamin D is directly involved in how well your immune system is functioning, your good immune cells, which are constantly gobbling up cancer cells circulating throughout the body, and other mechanisms as well. So vitamin D ties directly into prostate health, and as I'm sure you do, it's always shocking how many you know men and women we see in the clinic who have vitamin D deficiency, even here in Southern California. Uh, it's just very, very common, and of course, more common in other areas. And they have done uh, studies in men who have enlarged prostate uh, it is more common in men in northern latitudes, for example, where they're not getting as much sunshine and vitamin D, but you know it's even common in areas like ours. Yeah, in my, in my clinics, 80% uh, of my initial patients are, are vitamin D deficient. Uh, and people are shocked, you know, well, wait a minute, you're in Southern California, and how, how can that be? Uh, but unfortunately, uh, most of our patients are wearing sunscreen. Uh, people are not going out as much outside as people assume we all do. And yeah, it's even in sunny soap, Southern California, we have vitamin D deficiency, severe. Yeah, that, yeah and that's true. And there have been some good population studies with uh, blood vitamin D levels and a man's risk of prostate cancer. And depending which study you look at, let's just say, you know, most labs use a range of about 30 to 100 units 
Um, in these studies, the most protective level was generally above 41. Some show above 44, around 50. So I think it's critical for you know, preventing these serious conditions like prostate cancer, other cancers, even prostate enlargement. Know what your vitamin D level is and get it optimized. So uh, I guess one of the things that a guy who's listening to this or the wife of the guy listening to this, can you, or the husband of the guy listening to this, um, can you actually shrink a prostate by changing diet, by getting your vitamin D level up, by getting insulin resistance get taken care of, and supplements? And so that's a big subject, but can it be reversed? Well, it's a good question. Certainly, we can definitively say that when you follow the integrative or natural protocols, the diet improvements, targeted nutritional supplements, losing weight, improving that insulin resistance, you know, addressing nutritional deficiencies, certainly it's been very well shown you can improve your symptoms. So you, the most common issues are the urinary symptoms. So you can definitely improve those, especially if you're in that mild to moderate category of prostate enlargement, which is, which is most men. So that part we know for a fact. But recent research, which I talk about in the book, they actually have done some studies, for example, with the common herb, saw palmetto, when used at the right concentration of dose. They did show a mild decrease in prostate size uh, based on ultrasound studies before and after. So, yes, you can to some degree. Now, I wouldn't, you know, exaggerate it. It's not like if you're prostate is 50% larger than what it should, you're going to shrink it by 50%. But yes, uh, studies have shown using ultrasound, you can mildly decrease the size of the prostate with these uh, nutritional approaches. So you mentioned, you know, uh, just a minute ago about, you know, all of the published studies on the, the health benefits of, of algae. And because algae really isn't you know high on people's lists of you know oh i need algae for my health give me a give, give our listeners kind of a rundown of you know okay what what the heck are the health benefits besides exactly. okay Sure. So as I mentioned, there's two algae. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is spirulina. It's considered a blue-green algae because it has two pigments in it. A blue one called phycocyanin and a green one which is called chlorophyll, which most people know about. So what is algae known, uh, spirulina known for? It's known for satisfying your hunger and giving you energy mentally and physically. How does it do that? Spirulina has the highest concentration of protein in the world. Ours is 64% protein. That's just to compare with animal protein. It's about three times the amount of protein is uh, found in animal protein. And that's why the United Nations actually endorses it as the world answer to world hunger because of this high protein. E importantly, all that protein is already in amino acid form. So your body doesn't have to work to get access to it. And it's loaded with B vitamins, which convert the aminos into energy. It's loaded with iron that carries oxygen which gives you energy. It's loaded with essential fatty acids like omega-3 that helps with your brain thought. It's known as a vasodilator that opens up your blood vessels so your nutrients and your oxygen can flow better to your muscles and your brain. And so, so that's why athletes, we work with NHL teams, Olympic teams, runners, triathletes who use it to give them energy. And it doesn't upset their stomach because, of course, there's no caffeine, chemicals, or sugar, or lectins or oxalates. So spirulina is a very energizing algae, both physically and mentally. But I know we're going to talk a little bit about intermittent fasting. The other great thing about spirulina is because it's so rich in protein and essential fatty acids, it satisfies your hunger. And there is no, there are no carbs. So it's great for intermittent fasting or if you're on a keto diet because it does not decrease your ketones or increase your glucose. And this has been studied and documented. So a lot of people use it for intermittent fasting. You might have four or five or five or ten tablets in the morning. It doesn't break your fast at all. But you're not hungry. You're not tired. And it gives you all the nutritional value that you need anyways so that you can, you can eliminate a lot of those fake supplements you might be taking. Uh, by the way, there's only one calorie per tablet. So if you take five or ten tablets, for 10 calories, you can have your hunger satisfied for hours and, um, you know, and get all the other nutrients. There's 40 other vitamins and minerals in it. So what, I don't know anything that can do that. So it's a great meal replacement. 
for assisting you with weight loss, intermittent fasting, and as I mentioned, um, it gives you the energy. So most people take the spirulina, which we call energy bits, um, uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, when you're tired, you get a slump, or before a workout. So let, let, me, let me stop you there. You mentioned blue-green algae. And on the internet, you look up blue-green algae and you see these play th sites that say, oh my gosh, blue-green algae is lethal and don't come near it and it'll kill you. Uh, what say you? Well, that's why at the very beginning I pointed out that algae grows everywhere. And if it comes from the ocean or the lakes or the streams or your swimming pool, it's toxic. So yes, the blue-green algae in your ocean and uh, is going to be toxic because it's in a in a uh, it's wild in the in the environment. It is not toxic when it's harvested like we do in fresh uh, in fresh triple filtered spring mountain water. And we're probably the only company that I know in the United States that does three third-party lab tests at an FDA-approved lab because we sell our our algae tablets both on our website energybits.com, but mostly through doctors, um, uh, functional medicine, longevity centers, and they need to see that there are no toxins in our algae. So we do third-party lab tests. We even do a third set to prove there's no myco, uh, my, my, uh, mitotoxins in there. So, so we are totally buttoned up. Uh, not every company is, but we certainly are. But that's why if you go on the internet and you see stuff about toxic blue algae, I can promise you it's relating to t algae that's grown in the ocean or somewhere wild. Do you have any, any go-to foods? Um, years ago when I started studying people's food habits, people in general uh, actually have five main dishes or main meals that they just repeat over and over and over again. And so you got any go-to things that you, know, you just repeat all, all the time? Yeah, that's, that's really true. Uh, I'd have to say that uh, cassava flour flatbread is my go-to. Even when I'm not planning that that's gonna be breakfast or lunch, it just is. And when you have some sort of spread, uh, I can show you, if you check out my uh, YouTube, I can show you a uh, uh, Brazil nut uh, sour cream, a vegan sour cream with Brazil nuts that you can spread on there, or maybe just do the olive oil and uh, balsamic vinegar, and it's so good and it's so easy that I, I eat it every day. Wow. Oh, you're making me hungry. We're, we're going to pause here. We're gonna, we'll be right back. I'm, I'm going to go to his YouTube channel. I'm going to find out how to make it. Oh, okay. Well, we're back. No. <laughs> oh, here we are. We're, we're just joking. All right. Everybody talks about B12 and vegans. What say you? Okay. So I supplement that stuff uh, with Plant Paradox. Uh, if you are as sensitive as I am, uh, what you want to do is get the capsule and open it up into some cranberry juice. And yeah, don't just take the contents, not the capsule. And I supplement it. It's that simple. I think there's a little bit in mushrooms. And yeah. uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I, you know, some of your past guests, including you, talk about having a biodiversity in your gut um, with the microbiome and I, every now and again, I'll do the shellfish thing. I'll do the, uh, halibut thing, uh, just to make sure that I'm healthy in my stomach. I don't want to be running into IBS because there's only one type of bacteria in there or it's just not working for me. So, uh, yes, I do. I do cheat on veganism, uh, every now and again, and I'm totally comfortable saying before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm -hmm.